Strap on your earbuds, ladies and gents. You're listening to a full Monty version of Broken Boner Radio. Don't feel down if you can't get it up. We all need to find the fun in being dysfunctional. It can be brutal if you've got a limp noodle. Getting hard is hard to do, but we're here for you. It's Broken Boner Radio. Here's your host, Daniel Canfield. I had the most interesting telephone conversation today. It was with a 27-year-old gentleman by the name of Colin Longren. And to his knowledge, he is the youngest man ever to have a penile implant. Uh, 27 years old. Oh, and, I've put penile implants in teenagers. Oh, you so. have? Yes. Okay. Well, this is Dr. Goldstein. I want to welcome you to the show. He, <laughs> he gets to pipe in on the, on the conversations here. Um, we're going to have a long discussion about uh, more things about erectile dysfunction. But yeah, doctor, w- welcome to the show again. This is your second time with me. I'm really excited to talk to you again. Daniel, you are a rock star for doing this. This is unbelievable. Getting the word out is so important. Well, thank you. My conversation with Colin was was fascinating. That actually came about because, uh, as you know, the uh, the fine folks at Coloplast, who actually manufacture the penile implant that I have, the, the Titan model, contacted me. Some, somehow through the, uh, the universe of the internet, they heard about my podcast, and they had heard that you were my doctor and uh, that you had indeed done my implant. And I guess they reached out to you through email to verify what I was saying. I verified it. <laughs> yeah. You are my patient. You do have an implant. Well, I was blown away. And, uh, unlike most patients, you're willing to talk about all of this, and that's the unique part of Daniel. Well, that, that's my mission, and it, it was crazy because we've only been doing this for not even a couple of months now, and already somehow their team heard one of my podcasts, and they reached out to me, and we had a wonderful conversation, and they connected me with this uh, Colin Longren. Uh, he's more from the Midwest, and my contact at Coloplast put us in touch with each other. And he, too, is a young man who's willing to stand up and talk about erectile dysfunction. He's got his own. Cool. Right? And I'm excited. I'm, uh, I talked to him, yet, uh, and he's actually going to come on and, and be a guest. Well, say hi to him for me. I will. <laughs> Listeners can tune into that soon. It'll It'll be within the next few weeks. So you said you've put implants in 18 year olds i think even younger but wow certainly young men don't really have the usual reasons for a penile implant which is aging and vascular disease associated with aging and high cholesterol and diabetes and being overweight having hypertension what we call metabolic syndrome but there are young men who get involved in car accidents pelvic fractures uh, severe trauma to the groin area, BMX riding, bicycles, uh, other, you know, motorcycle accidents. So what are you supposed to do <laughs> yeah. if they have uh, severe erectile dysfunction, severe tissue injury from the trauma, as opposed to from the usual uh, vascular risk factors? So in those cases, conversation is usually had with the parents and the, and the individual, and as needed, penile implants are inserted. I don't think he's quite as inquisitive about what's wrong with him as far as like, I told him how I'd met you watching a, a surgery online and he, he shrieked at that. He goes, oh my God, he goes, that's the last thing I'd want to watch. I, that stuff makes me really nervous and I can't watch that kind of stuff. So he, I, I got the sense he, he, doesn't, he wasn't as inquisitive about why he had erectile dysfunction from birth. But his diagnosis, he didn't have any uh, understanding of why, but he he said he's never, ever, ever had an erection of any type. That's so amazing. Wow. He said his implant surgery was actually very painful because I guess the doctors told him when your penis has never enlarged, <laughs> has never been engorged, the tissues never stretched, that doing the surgery was much more painful for him because even just having the prosthesis in his penis was more painful than usual. His recovery time is twice as long as mine, and he's half my age. It's interesting. I think the message to the audience is that whatever pain happens goes away. (laughs) If you're going to be undergoing this kind of therapy, a surgical penile prosthesis, and the pain is persistent, that's not a good sign. That's usually an infection. That needs to be addressed with the healthcare provider that did the surgery. But in usual, like 
way over 95% of cases, implant infection does not occur. This unique device that the uh, Coloplast makes, the Titan, I don't know if you know this, it's hydrophilic coated. Do you know that? I saw that. I was doing my own little research on what's in me. <laughs> I always kind of like to know <laughs> like what it is. And yeah, I saw that term and I have no clue what that means. Yeah, it's remarkable engineering. Uh, I love the device because from my point of view, girth is really important in hardness. And it's just a, a traditional engineering concept. It's called aspect ratio, A-S-P-E-C-T ratio. So it's diameter over length. If you have reasonable length, you want it to be wide. Uh, this is the only device in the market that the device widens to the tunic albuginea, which is the wall of the erection chamber. Hmm. Other products make devices, but they have a fabric that surrounds the device so that it widens only to the width of the fabric, not to the width of the penis. So oh. the coloplast has the widest girth of any device out there. And girth is very critical for hardness. And of course, hardness is really important for success in this procedure. Getting back to hydrophilic coating, another reason why I love this device is that it's coated with material that absorbs what you place next to it. So if you place a series of antibiotics, the antibiotics actually stick to the surface and then form a, a wall of defense, if you like, against the generation of infection with the implant. So that's huge. I mean, our data at Alvarado Hospital, where I work, is that for the last 10 years, I've done penile implants with this Coloplus device and its hydrophilic coating. And we have placed a myriad of different antibiotics uh, that uh, we have tried, and we have yet to have an infection. So uh, something is going right at Alvarado Hospital, but I think it's it's in part or a large part the hydrophilic coating uh, design that the Coloplast has. Fascinating. I, I'm coming up with a visual for this to put on the website, but the th I call it the three-headed dragon of ED. Okay. You've got the biological, you've got the psychosocial, and you've got the skeletal muscular. It's like the dragon, the body of the dragon is Ed. We're calling him Edward. Sir Edward, the dragon of ED. <laughs> and you got the biological head, the psychosocial head, and the skeletal muscular head. And Yeah, that's fabulous because our model in San Diego is to have within one facility healthcare providers for the biopsychosocial, excuse me, the psychosocial, biologic, and the musculoskeletal. And a visit in our place is a four hour extravaganza where you get to see all these different healthcare providers. Having it in one facility allows one patient to, to get the whole sort of assessment at one time. You know, often you go see the biologist and he sets you up with the psychologist and it's two months later and it doesn't work out. Yeah. Well, what I'm excited about here at Broken Bone Radio is your specialist that you're... I can't get used to your broken boner. I I have to say. <laughs> hey, it's my lightning rod. It's what, you know, Coloplast heard it and they're like, oh my gosh, we, we've got to listen to this. And it is my lightning rod. I'm, a, I'm not going to not gonna lie. I'll never get used to it. It's I don't want people to get from. used to it. I want it to shake people up. I want them, to, they'll remember it. But the exciting thing for our listeners, you just talked about, you have all these specialists in one facility and you have, a, you know, the treatment that takes, or the assessment that takes to four hours and they see all your different specialists during this time, correct? That is 100% correct. In all patients, we make an effort that everybody, we're so anal obsessive and neurotic about this. Even more cool, if you really worked in the facility and see how cool it is. So as the patient finishes with assessment one, let's say the musculoskeletal, the musculoskeletal person comes down to my office and tells me what we found. And the psychologist listens to hear what the musculoskeletal person hears. And then when, when the psychosocial person is now interviewing this patient, she will know what she has found in other assessments. In other words, after every hour, we all meet, discuss what the heck we're talking about on each patient so that I know what has happened to that person. They know what I have seen. It depends on the order of the assessment, but it's really cool, the interaction among the professionals. Uh, of all the things we do, that is one of the coolest things we do. And what's really cool for me is as the founder and host of Broken Boner Radio, I have assembled those specialists on our show. I wasn't aware. You did Debbie as well? Well, I, I'm lining Debbie up. Debbie is your skeletal muscular specialist. 
Yeah, she, it's called pelvic floor physical therapy. Yeah, so she's agreed. She's talked to Dr. Rose Hartzell, who's your your sexual therapist. I've already interviewed her. So what I'm excited about is all that cool stuff you're just talking about that people can get when they come to your facility. So whether you know this, I'm sure you know this, but Kinsey is the the god, the, the person who opened the door for sexual assessment being scientific. Right. And he wrote the book on men and the book on women. It's since 1948 and 1952. This goes back. He is the beginning, and the Kinsey Institute, which recognizes his accomplishments, is in Indiana, and that's, of course, uh, where Dr. Hartson trained. So uh, she has carried the torch (laughs) from the originator and is now here in San Diego. She's awesome. Well, what I'm so humbled and honored by to having part of your team as a part of the Broken Boner Radio and the DanielCanfield.com, the you know, Voice of Erectile Dysfunction site, is I can bring interviews from your specialists and talk about things. So if people live somewhere else around the world, they can't get to San Diego Sexual Medicine. They can at least get some expert advice and listen to people. I can ask questions of you and your specialists about these different things, and hopefully it'll lead them. My goal is to lead people to getting the proper assessment when they think they may have erectile dysfunction. There's there's so many ED clinics popping up out there and testosterone clinics that I don't know what your feeling is on those, but I get a little squirrely because they feel like they're not quite thorough, as, as thorough. Well, a lot of the clinics are simply scam clinics that are designed to administer injections. And the doctors are sort of retired non-sexual medicine experts who get paid by how many patients they they get on injections and they way overcharge injections i mean injections are really just several dollars a, a shot and they make injections hundred dollars thousands of dollars a shot it's quite the scam and it's extremely sad you know it's just kind of a commentary anytime something you know as we bring erectile dysfunction to the forefront all the the big pharma companies that spent billions of dollars advertising viagra and cialis and levita and all that ED has become kind of a buzzword now, as is testosterone treatments for men. And you have these clinics start popping up. You know, they kind of grab the low-hanging fruit and work with men who aren't willing to invest the time. It's called being desperate. The other problem that's being called, which is a, a true testimony to their success, is they actually discuss on the newspaper this uh, condition. They come right at you and talk about it. Whereas if you go to your average doctor... They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to know about it. They want to discuss it. So uh, they take advantage of their being sort of like Daniel Canfield. The nightmare is they're more motivated financially as opposed to uh, motivated by sexual medicine science, as it were. Well, it's interesting you say that because a friend of mine, I even told you that I had referred him to you. And he's not necessarily suffering from erectile dysfunction, but he's starting to feel the symptoms of low testosterone and and low T4 and T3 hormones from the thyroid, this kind of lackluster feeling for life that I had felt. And I said, you know, go to Dr. Goldstein and get the assessment, find out what's going on. When he found out he had to sit with Dr. Rose Hartzell, a female, he said, no fucking way. (laughs) His exact words. No fucking way will I sit and talk to a woman about my so sad actual stuff. And I was like, dude. So he ended Sounds up. Sounds like Rudy Giuliano saying, we don't want a woman in the White House. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, and again, it's a commentary on us masculine men that so many of us are like so macho. It's like we have a hard time even thinking about it to ourselves in the mirror in the morning, but let alone talk to one of our buddies about it. But last of all, To talk to a woman about it, that's pretty much was his attitude. And he canceled his appointment and he ended up going to a T clinic, a testosterone clinic. And, you know, they prescribed him with, you know, and he's spending like four or $500 a month on injections. He spent 10 minutes in the office. He said his visit was maybe total a half hour from checking in, seeing the doctor, getting his prescription and leaving was maybe a total of a half hour. And your full assessment takes four hours. There's a right way to do something and a not quite so right way. You do what you need to do, but I really encourage you. Yeah, but look away. He didn't have to speak to a woman about his sexual health, biopsychosocial things. Exactly. (laughs) He's spending $400 a month on injections. To avoid that. (laughs) Mine's less than $40 because I'm not getting ripped off. And that lasts me 10 months. So anyway, let's move on. You had mentioned injections. That was one thing. uh, Trimax. Oh, Trimax. Okay. Is that the kind of There's injection? all kinds of injections. Oh, okay. okay. 
Well, I had done part of as well as you know documented on my show and on my website that I've gone through all the different treatments ending up with a penile implant. As well you should. I mean, penile implants are in medicine for any medical problem. There ought to be a consensed expert way to handle the progression of treatment. And that's called process of care. It's it's called step care. You start at the least invasive, least costly, least problematic, and move your way through a system which then ends at the most invasive, most expensive, most difficult. So if you put it the, the logical sequence, uh, let's say arthritis, you would start with, say, aspirin or Motrin as a first treatment maybe injections of various agents like steroids into the joint space. And then finally, the placement of uh, of like a hip implant or a knee implant or elbow implant as your final most complicated version. So erectile dysfunction follows a, a quite similar process of care where penile implants are really ought to be performed when everything else has failed. So everything else includes this concept of a penile self-injection therapy. And you went through that as well as you should have. And, and I have to say that was probably of all the treatments, um, even because <laughs> I was a needle phobe. So the thought of sticking a needle in my penis, was <laughs> the, I, I couldn't fathom that I'd ever be able to do it. Because unlike like when I give blood, I could look away and not see the needle penetrating my skin. When you're doing your own injection, you have to watch. You, you have to pay attention to what you're doing. So surprisingly, I got over that. And it it worked really, really well for me for about a year. And then that too started to fail. Now, explain to the listeners what Trimex is, how it works, and how for me with corporal uh, erectile tissue fibrosis, it eventually, the injections stopped working altogether. Explain a little bit about the the science and the chemistry behind it. All right, so I'm going to actually take you back to 1983. Where were you, Dan, in 1983? 1983, I was married to my wife, Jill, at the time, who's the mother of my three kids. Yeah, we were just married. We got married in 80. How old were you in 1983? Oh, you're asking me this. I'm 63 now, whatever that is. I was probably 30 something. Okay, so in 1983, the American Urological Association, so this is a medical society where the urologists of the world, really, but in particular the United States, meet on an annual convention basis. So the AUA's annual meeting in 1983 happened to be in Las Vegas, and I received about a month prior to the meeting an invitation to speak at a evening seminar where an invited speaker from England would take the first hour talking about neurophysiology of penile erection. His name was Dr. Giles, G-I-L-E-S, Brindley, B-R-I-N-D, Brindley, L-E-Y. So say that again, Uh, neuro... Neurophysiology of penile erection. So, you know, how a penile erection worked. I guess it's not so obvious to everybody that we have studied ad nauseum how the lung works, how the liver works, how the spleen works, how the pancreas works. But there was an awful lot of controversy of how a penile erection worked back in 1983. I know it sounds weird, but in fact, there has been really little science dedicated to the understanding of the physiology of how penile erection works compared to any other organ. Maybe it, maybe it's not so impossible to figure that out, but that is true. So back in 1982, so one year prior to the 1983 meeting, I attended an international conference in Copenhagen, and there were many hundreds of people. You could sort of say uh, Bud Light, better tasting, less filling, whereas some people say it's better tasting and some people say it's less filling. On one side of the auditorium hall, people said to get an erection, the muscles of the penis had to contract. And if you sort of say you you make a fist of a penile erection and you sort of make that fist, you sort of say to get an erection, your muscles must contract. It's not an illogical concept. In fact, you would think intuitively that's a fact what happened. But there was the other side of the audience said that can't work. The muscles must relax because the blood has to fill. And for that to happen, the muscles need to relax to allow the spaces to increase so that the girth can widen and lengthen. 
and the penis lengthen. So there was huge controversy, which which was correct. You couldn't have both ways. You can't have something contract and relax at the same time. So in 1983, neurophysiology studies of erection were welcomed because we, we genuinely did not know how a penile erection worked. I know that sounds so crazy, but in fact, that was true. So here comes Giles Brindley, uh, serendipitously, as I was speaking after him. So there was an hour of him and an hour after him. uh, There were four 15-minute speakers. I was one of the 15-minute speakers. And I was speaking on what's called penile revascularization, which was how we borrow an artery from the stomach, connect it to the penis to increase blood flow to help men, typically young men, improve their erectile function. So that's not unlike some people have heart surgeries. They take a vein from the leg. It's, it's pretty much the same, yeah. That's, that's a good pickup. So uh, I go, in, it was 1983, we didn't have computers back then. So we have these slide carousels. You, you, you may remember them. I remember those Most days. Most people yep. have forgotten them. So I had my slide carousel with me and you sort of work with the AV person, make sure it's working, make sure the, that there's a lock, uh, a, a circular thing that locks in place. God forbid that falls out and all your slides fall to the floor. That's a nightmare. That has happened. Anyways, I, I submit my a carousel. Uh, Giles Brindley submits his carousel, except I didn't know who he was. And there was this, he was British, so I got his accent. And so I related him to Giles Brindley. But he was dressed in a jogging outfit. Here, of course, I was my suit and tie. Uh, we both headed towards the men's room, uh, not an uncommon place to go just prior to you speak. I went into the stall to pass some water. Uh, and he goes into the bathroom where you shut the door, and I didn't think much of it. But at the time, I realized what he was doing was injecting his penis with a medicine called phenoxybenzamine, which is a long-acting adrenergic blocker. Oh, my God. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. But in the <laughs> middle of his lecture, it was pretty interesting because he showed many, many photos of his own penis at various states of erection with various drugs that he was trying to sort of figure out whether the muscle was in fact relaxing or contracting because that was the huge controversy at the time. To better understand the neurophysiology of erection would help us treat it better. So he had these ideas and they were sort of interesting, but he used his own penis that he would take a camera of uh, the angle of erection. And I have to say, it's a pretty remarkable uh, lecture. However, so wait a minute. What well, I thought well, back was a second. So, so he, <laughs> I'm getting this visual. You're at this conference. He goes into the bathroom. This, there's hundreds of people in the audience, men and himself. women, dressed in you know evening gowns and suits. And here's this gentleman showing his erection off in front of everybody. That's what I'm going to say. He came back out on stage and showed off. Oh no, he he's not only on stage. He's speaking. He's standing in front of the podium, right. doing this. Lecture. Wow. So you have the visual. Okay. So it gets it gets more interesting. In fact. It is the most remarkable lecture I've ever attended in my life. What was the reaction? I mean, these are all medical professionals, correct? Right. It was sort of interesting. But let me get you to the bottom line here. About 15 minutes left in the lecture, he uses this expression, oh, hell, uh, in in only the way a British person can do. And he takes his pants down. Remember, he's in a jogging outfit. And he has his raging erections sticking out of his pants. And now the audience is bewildered. <laughs> I mean, there's like ast- astonishment. Nobody does this. <laughs> of course. <laughs> at a lecture at a scientific society meeting. And it gets a tiny bit worse. He's fearful that people think his erection is due to the penile implant. And he doesn't want people to think that because his erection is based on an administration of a drug to his penis by an injection, which nobody had ever thought of doing prior to that lecture. However, he then walks around the audience with his erection, asking people to feel it to verify that it wasn't a penile implant. Now, I'm sure you're getting the visual, but it's it's yeah, like, frighteningly so. Yeah, it's getting to be. Uh, How did he not uh, get arrested? I mean, that's well. So this is science, and this was about the neurophysiology of erection. 
And like I said, this was one of the most amazing lectures I had ever seen. So he gets back up to the audience. I don't know if anyone actually touched it, but let's just say there was there was uh, unbelievable buzz in the audience. And basically, he announced that he had injected a drug that caused muscle relaxation and that he now had a penile erection and he had had it throughout the entire lecture <laughs> and it wasn't going away. And he normally injects himself with various agents to better understand the neurophysiology of erection. When he came across this agent and found that this caused erection, he was now quite convinced that anyone who thought that drugs that cause muscles to relax caused erection and that drugs that cause muscles to contract actually got rid of the erection. And in one millisecond, <laughs> in 1983, at the American Urology Association, the controversy ceased. Uh, uh, it was definitely a muscle that was relaxed that was going to cause erection. Of course, Viagra, of course, causes muscles to relax. And Viagra took full advantage of this <laughs> lecture to, to establish itself as an oral way to deliver the medication. Now, you mentioned Viagra. This, that was 1983. So Viagra didn't come out until... Come out until 1998, 15 years later. Wow. Until they figured out how to do an oral version of the injection version. But the, you couldn't go to square one about an oral drug until you realized you had to develop muscle relaxation with the oral agent. So as I said, Viagra took full advantage of this uh, lecture knowledge. But more importantly, within a week of having gone back to, at that time, the East Coast where I worked, we had patients doing self-injection. So I, I need you to appreciate, we had people struggling with uh, erectile dysfunction. We had no drugs FDA approved. The only thing we had approved in 1973, where it first came out, was the penile implant. Ten years later, we were still only doing penile implants as our treatment. And all of a sudden, the first ever drug management was observed at a meeting, and then in an off-label way, it was not FDA approved, it was just off-label used, we had patients on this treatment. Just think of the impact that this lecture had on the, the patients in our field. I mean, That's it was amazing. Just, just amazing. I don't know, I've never been to a lecture so profound and so odd, but so game-changing as this lecture. But in any case, that, that wasn't your question. <laughs> Getting back to your question, uh, we have uh, Trimix, which is a mixture of three different injection medicines that muscle relax based on the 1983 observation. Biomix is two drugs that recognize muscle relaxation capabilities. And these agents have become fairly standard. They're absolutely not FDA approved. They're completely off-label. Off but they work, they're time-tested. There's uh, hundreds of manuscripts documenting their safety and efficacy, and they have become, I guess, standard of care. And, uh, Daniel, we have something in the range of seven to 8,000 men on injections, just to show you how we believe in the therapy, how it's effective as it was in you for a period of time, and, uh, and how it's a part of the process of care. It is something that you really ought to do or consider doing if the explanation is, of course, due to tissue injury. I can say firsthand, not only from how it worked for me for a while, but also my son, Ryan, who, again, was a guest on my show, has erectile dysfunction. He has the same genetically predisposed condition I have, um, is on injections. You've put him on injections, and the injections have changed his life, his, the way he feels about himself. Um, he's got a beautiful relationship now with a young lady that uh, he's just blossoming as a human being, as a masculine male. And uh, it's all so exciting to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, fabulous. Absolutely. That's the joy of what we do for a living, I must say. And he knows, having me as his father, he, he knows now that the next step, when, when these start to fail, if they fail, that he has the penile implant in front of him at some point. And knowing, having me as an example and knowing how it, that implant has changed my life, he is so much more relaxed about his sexuality, so much more empowered about it, his masculinity, that, that he's looking to the future without this, you know, brain fuck going on. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about. I do. Have, have Ryan thank Giles Brindley one day. <laughs> okay. I don't know if he knows that story. I'll, I'll have to tell him that story. That's pretty fun. Please. It's certainly a classic in, in our field. Wow. So explain to the listeners, my injections worked for about a year, and then they just slowly 
decreased in their effectiveness to where we got you and I mutually and along with my wife and the rest of your team said, it's time for me to get my penile implant. What happened with my condition that caused the injections to stop working? So because you went to a facility where diagnostic studies are really enamored and encouraged to undergo, we identified using grayscale, G-R-A-Y-S-C-A-L-E, ultrasound, grayscale ultrasound, that you had fibrosis or scarring excess of the erectile tissue of your erection chamber. And if you sort of think about how an erection occurs, there needs to be a mechanism where the blood that is brought into your penis during sexual arousal actually traps, T-R-A-P-S, traps with a, a sort of a valve mechanism that makes the erection chamber virtually a closed compartment. If you blow up a balloon and put air into the rubber covering of the balloon, you have to tie a knot at the neck of the balloon so that the air is trapped in a closed compartment. And then you have a hydraulic system like a balloon or a tire. Right. Well, your penis is the same. There needs to be a trapping mechanism. Uh, it took a little while to figure all this out, but the trapping mechanism occurs by the erection tissue expanding. There's a mechanical property called expandability of a tissue, and it relates to, given a force, how much will the tissue expand in millimeters? It's a classic engineering term. If you have excess fibrosis or scarring of the erection tissue, then the erection tissue expandability is reduced. That means it can't push out against its wall. Its ability to push out against its wall is how trapping occurs, because the way God made the anatomy, all the draining little veins that bring the, the blood from the penis back to the heart exist in the peripheral edge of the erection tissue. So to shut it down, you have to expand the tissue against the wall, thereby compress and close the tiny little draining veins. So if your tissue has excess scarring, it wants to recoil as opposed to maintain its expansion against the, the wall. So if it recoils, then you drain the blood from your penis and you lose the erection, which is a very frustrating but very common problem. As you had mentioned in, in my condition, the, the fibrosis is degenerative. It, it'll get worse. So mine just kept getting worse to where even the injections didn't work. I, I do have to tell the listeners, as much as I was afraid to do injections, once I got used to it, it really wasn't very painful. I wouldn't even say it was painful. It gave me a different feeling I wasn't used to of being very engorged once it, you know, I got the erection. But the actual injections were pretty painless. So it, for the listeners out there, don't shy away from looking into that as a potential therapy for your ED. Doctor, we're almost at the end of our show, and I've got one fun, you know, I'm very irreverent. Broken Boner Radio is meant to be irreverent. And I have a really weird question I want to ask you that I know a lot of listeners out there may want to know. And I don't even know if you have an answer for this. But we all know what whiskey dick is. We have too much to drink, or some guys do too many drugs, or what have you, and they cannot achieve an erection. Would you be willing to address what causes that? Yeah, no, that's pretty straightforward. That's uh, well described, well studied, actually. So there's two events in achieving this closed compartment. The, the tissue has to be expandable, and the muscle must relax maximally. So you injure temporarily with alcohol the ability of the muscle to relax. The, the muscle is not responsive like it should be to the body's sexual arousal's effort to cause muscle relaxation. You can take penile smooth muscle tissue and put it in what's called an organ bath and study the ability of penile tissue to relax or to contract. Alcohol interferes with its ability to relax, and, and that's exactly what happens. Uh, the muscle is ineffective as a, in its ability to relax, and therefore you can't shut down the outflow. Wow. So there's actually a physiological change. I think you have to assume that anything and everything that's erectile dysfunction has a physiologic explanation. It's just that maybe we don't know all of the explanations at this time in life, but something has to explain what's going on. And, and I'm pretty much convinced that everything could be explained if we just had enough time and effort and money to, to study these things. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to sit with me again today and uh, shed light on this erectile dysfunction phenomenon that we're all getting more used to talking about. Thank you, Daniel. You have a great, great day. And, and congratulations again for allowing people to learn about this issue. Absolutely. Thank you again, doctor. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 
Okay, that's it for today. I'm totally spent, and people, I need to go take a nap. If you'd like to call and leave a question or comment for the show, 405-592-6637. That's 405-59-BONER. You can find me on Facebook at Broken Boner Radio or DanielCanfield.com, or you can even follow me on Twitter at Real Broken Boner. I want to give a shout out to my production team at PodcastFastTrack.com. Carrie, you know I couldn't do this without you. And I can't wait to talk more about my erectile dysfunction with all of you in future episodes. In the meantime, keep it real. 